Did you really think that this boss would not have two phases? I've used my legendary action on your turn to split this video into two parts. If you want to see the rest of this bedraggled bastard's nitpicking, you'll have to come back next month. <laughs> again, really? Again. Hello, spicy adventurers of the Forgotten Realms. That's right, it was me the whole time. I'm Spice 8 Rack, aka Paladin in the Streets, Bard in the Sheets, and welcome back to the channel. A few weeks ago, I released the first half of my hardcore analysis of all of Magic the Gathering's Dungeons and Dragons cards, and I'm back less than a month later to finish the job. If you haven't seen it yet, here's a little taster of what you've been missing. Dancing Sword. Oh, I'm so glad I decided to film this video instead of just recording it, because now I get to do little bits like this. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Why hasn't my school asked me to come back to give a talk? Uh, that's all I want to know. Anyway, I have yet to cover the red or green cards of Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, uh, which I totally did on purpose because of red and green's association with the festive period, and not at all because that's just how I filmed it. The same caveats from the last video are carrying over to this one as well. Every single card in this set could be argued to be a D&D reference in some way or another, but a lot of them just aren't worth analysing. Like, yes, Great Axe is a weapon that you can have in D&D. Yes, Owl Bears are monsters from the D&D Monster Manual, but both cards have such little going on with them that it would be a massive waste of time to analyse them in any great detail. Also, as I've been informed by the, uh, close to 1,000 comments on the last video, I've made a couple of whoopsie doodles in terms of my analysis about some of the cards that I talk about. Indeed, there were a number of times in the last video where I was very unsure about how to analyse a card, or where I just said something that was patently incorrect. Uh, and I had enough of them in the last video, and I'm sure I'm going to have enough of them in this one as well, uh, that I'm fixing to make a companion video to come out in January, uh, fixing all of the mistakes uh, that I've made in this video and the last. So do leave a comment if you notice something that I've gotten wrong. I really do appreciate it. I do love learning. Your comment might end up in a video in a month's time or so. Uh, and also I think I think commenting on videos helps boost it in the algorithm and stuff and makes the video do better. I'm gonna be honest, I don't really know what I'm doing with my job. My boss is an app and my office is a corridor. Help me. Anyway, with all of that bollocks out of the way, come with me now as I complete the task that Satan himself set me upon this earth to accomplish and analyse the rest of Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Featuring Lily Simpson. Sponsored by BespokePost.com May contain nuts. Doesn't contain nuts, actually. Um... It just, there was a rule, there was a rule of three thing that was happening with the like, moving away and then cut back to, there's another thing to say, um, it doesn't actually contain nuts, I shouldn't joke about allergies and the like, um, in my video, so you know, you're safe if you've got a nut allergy, um, this video does contain goblins, though, so. Goblins, these n- It's time to talk about red cards! Same fucking payphone I'm calling north to mum to ask What year the Mustang is And when she answers I I hear your voice dad Our first red spell is Burning Hands And I don't really have much to say about this card mechanically It's a fire spell that does damage yeah, that makes sense. But the flavour text of this card really did pique my imagination. Uh, a simple spell that grows in intensity along with its caster. Uh, with a little bit of tweaking, I think it would have been a really 
fun and interesting mechanic for there to have been spells within this set that scaled depending on whatever the highest level of class cards you controlled was. Like for example, a level 1 wizard could have cast Burning Hands as a shock, uh, level 2 could have cast it as a demon bolt, uh, level 3 could have cast it as a burn away. I think having specific colour hate cards within a format is all well and good, but I just feel that this was the set to really delve into what it means to have a levelled up player or levelled up creatures and therefore levelled up spells. I just feel like this was a bit of a missed opportunity. Next up we have Chaos Channeler and a lot like the Sorcerer class, this feels like such a missed opportunity again to really explore wild magic surge in a truly random capacity. I would have absolutely adored some kind of askurza.com style effect for the highest level role on the wild magic surge that you have to literally look up on a fucking computer or on a smartphone the effect that this card has. Again, it would have been really, really stupid and potentially uh, everybody would have hated it because it means that you have to like fucking open up your iPhone in the middle of a match. But I just feel that Wild Magic Surge was kind of done dirty in this set. It wasn't nearly explored in the wildly chaotic way that it is in D&D. I mean, sure, I can discard a couple of cards and draw new ones, but none of that comes close to the unbridled joy of me attempting to cast a simple, I don't know, fucking mage hand and then inexplicably turning into a potted plant, like I'm Douglas fucking Adams. Critical hit, however, is an absolute slam dunk. Double strike is a near perfect encapsulation of what a critical hit actually does, which has you roll one, two, or even more damage dice upon hitting a natural 20 on your attack roll. Uh, the fact that it comes back to your hand on a natural 20 as well, even though mechanically is wildly insignificant, it's just a beautiful flavorful cherry on top of an otherwise sublime flavor pie. Hobgoblin Bandit Lord is next, and there's not much in terms of flavor or references that I want to talk about with this card, except for the fact that in preview season, uh, for a very long time, we only had the Spanish version of this card available. Uh, and the Spanish name for Hobgoblin Bandit Lord is Señor de los Banditos Hobgoblin, which is fucking sexy, actually. Goblin time! Goblin time! Oh, oh! Goblin time! Goblin time! Oh, oh! Now, you might be playing your cards in Adventures in the Forgotten Realms and be thinking, whoa, whoa, hold your horses here, Johnny Horse Holder. I've got me some goblins. I've got me some hobgoblins. I've also got me some bloody bugbears. How do I tell the difference between all of these kinds of goblins? And that's why you called me, uh, Vincent. D'Onofrio, King of the Goblin Boys, to teach you all about the differences between these three kinds of very important goblins. To start with, we have our quote-unquote standard goblins. These are small, ambitious humanoids that have learnt the value of cooperation and which yearn to be recognised in society, although goblin quote unquote again, society itself has yet to learn the value and importance of statescraft, but they are getting there and we need to offer them our critical support. And then we have bugbears, born for parties, hulking, long arms, can reach all kinds of shelves. They're a little bit more uh, reclusive than your regular goblin, a little bit more tyrannical, but who doesn't Love a tyrant, didn't write that in the script. Bad ad lib, bad ad lib. Walking that one back as we speak. Dang, I was so excited to talk about goblins that I forgot to talk about one of the one of the three types of goblins in this set. So I'm gonna quote directly from Volo's Guide to Monsters to explain a little bit about Hobgoblin society. Here we go, let's meet these fun boys. War is the lifeblood of hobgoblins. Its glories are the dreams that inspire them, its horrors don't feature in their nightmares, cowardice is more terrible to hobgoblins than dying, young hobgoblins start soldiering when they can walk and heed the mustering call as soon as they can wield their weapons capably, every legion in the hobgoblins' entire society forever stands prepared for war. I thought they were going to be like the biscuits. 
And there we go. Those are our three different kinds of goblins in Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. I'm Vincent D'Onofrio. I can't remember who I said uh, I was earlier on, but I'm that now. And you've just had Goblin Facts. Goblin time! Goblin time! Oh, oh! Goblin time! Goblin time! Help me! Our next card is Meteor Swarm, and there's not really much to say about, you know, if this card is a good or bad reflection of this of the spell Meteor Swarm. After all, both are big damage spells. It's pretty difficult to go wrong with that. However, I would like to point out the care and attention that the artist particularly uh, has taken in making sure that they're representing this spell correctly. In the artwork of Meteor Swarm, we are seeing four meteors being hurtled towards this poor fucking bastard, and in the spell Meteor Swarm you do indeed summon four meteors. Now obviously these four meteors can hit more than four things, however the splash damage can absolutely account for the fact that Meteor Swarm can target more than four creatures. The Orb of Dragonkind is a wondrous item that humans and elves use to defeat the evil dragons on their homeworld of crime. The orb itself in D&D can have a series of beneficial or detrimental effects, but its key feature is of course its ability to summon dragons, to call them from across the lands. Uh, represented here in the fact that how uh, this orb can both use its mana to summon dragons, but also how you can use this orb to literally find dragons in your deck. However, there is a fatal flaw in the design of this card. You see, in 5th edition, the Dungeon Master's Guide specifically says that the Orb of Dragonkind cannot be used to summon dragon deities. And yet, THE dragon deity Tiamat can well be summoned by this card in Magic. You can search for her and you can cast her. Additionally, this card can only summon evil dragons in Magic. D&D, and yet the card in Magic can very easily summon good dragons like the uh, adult gold dragon and of course uh, Nadar, as well as, you know, these fucking layabouts, uh, which it certainly could not do in D&D. Okay, Wish is our next card. Wishes are some of the most powerful spells in all of D&D. They can rewrite history, and this card obviously does not do that, and normally this would be a massive flavour fail. However, Wish as a term in Magic, colloquially, means an effect that allows you to search your sideboard for a card during a game and retrieve a card from it, a, a tutor for your sideboard as it were. As such, the fact that the card Wish does a Magic the Gathering Wish effect, which in a way is a little bit akin to how wishes let you uh, summon uh, something out of out of the ether, something that does not exist on this material plane, you too can reach outside of the game and choose one of up to 15 choices uh, for you to uh, best your opponent with. Now, Wish, ironically, isn't the most powerful version of a Wish-style effect that exists in Magic. Uh, however, the fact that it only lasts until the end of your turn, it only gives you the opportunity to cast uh, a card from your side sideboard uh, until the end of the turn, at least to me, captures that feeling of impulsivity that wishes in D&D sometimes uh, are just sometimes surrounded by. You, you rub a genie's lamp, it says, I'll give you a wish, and then your player character almost without thinking goes, oh, ah, uh, I want to be king, and then not really thinking about the consequences of that, just thinking in the moment. Uh, so I think that is a, a perfectly fine, apt, little twist on the Wish format in order to make it fit a little bit better with how Wishes feel in Dungeons and Dragons. A very, a very neat little card. Fucking love that frog. Love that boy. Zorn. Okay, so a Zorn is an elemental beast with a uh, treasure sense, which both allows it to seek out and find rich mineral deposits, as well as sense the huge hulking throbbing sacks of cash at your side when you and the rest of your murder tourist friends have pilfered yet another doomed inn on your third day of village ravaging. And if a Zorn catches you with that amount of stolen money, frankly, you do deserve to be killed by this three-armed bastard. And that's all for the red cards that we're going to talk about, but 
Of course, I said at the start, there's a bunch of cards that I, uh, I'm not covering just because they Th their references exist purely as names of things and they don't do anything particularly interesting. It's it's difficult to analyze something that needs no analysis. Uh, however, I thought it would be amiss to not at least include them in some capacity uh, in this video. And so, as the bard, I have written a very little song uh, just to cover all of the bases of all of the cards that I have not discussed so far. One, two, three. There has modern carnage, polymorph, feigned a fright and manticore. Open palms, bullshit, fly, malice, and composure. Ranty fang, play bullet, cry the owl, bear this fireball. Play not ally before Ellie's teleportation circle. Healing potion, boots of speed, a wizard, spellbook, lots of armor, flame skull, contact other planes, improv weapons, locking rope, I choose your weapon, not to be renamed, to pick up fighting style, thieves, tools, purple, one rally, maneuver, magic, messiah. Ah. Take fucking six. <laughs> take twelve. <laughs> take, um, take twenty-six. Ah. I'm never putting a fucking musical number again. Oh. Oh. Fuck music! A little bit later on YouTube.com we'll see a fully demonetized educational video about the growth of fascism right after a 20 minute rant about how pronouns are ruining western culture with no less than 4 mid-roll ads and a sponsorship segment. Up next, however, join Spice 8-Rack and its guest, Lily Simpson, as they break down all of the red legendary characters in Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Delina, Delina, Wild Maid. So for four mana, you get a 3-2 Elf Shaman, mm. and I'm <laughs> saying Shaman to just annoy you. Yeah, so Delina is a uh, character that was explicitly made for the Baldur's Gate comic book series. Her whole deal basically is she she's an she's a, she's an elfish sorcerer who has like an innate spark of magic generally from like the Fey or from some sort of um, place where magic runs wild. Um, with elves, it's often the Fey because they're all kind of very heavily linked to the Fey Wild um, because it's the closest emulation of Corellion's original plane, as we mentioned Corellion earlier on. Uh, wild magic is like a case of like, oh, like sometimes you'll have a wild magic surge, and like sometimes that'll like do something wacky and out out of you know out there that like you're not expecting, and it kind of works within to like the D20 as like a thing of like you can roll it, you can do it, and then roll again, and you, the wild magic is just sort of, like splintering outwards. Her deal in the comic book is basically that she has a twin brother who was uh, ah. uh, kidnapped by this sort of evil cult um, and is now like trying to turn into a dragon and is evil and part of the cult and is trying to turn into himself a dragon and by doing so he's trying to, like, he's trying to steal her powers so that he can get the power to do so. Well, her, her having that wild magic, um, like being tied to like obviously D20 rolling is pretty cool and the fact that she had a twin and that's kind of being represented in the like the twinning effect of her creating a copy of a creature is kind of cool. I think any fan of the comic books is probably just going to be happy that she got included at all. Um, speaking of people that we maybe are incited to see, although I, I don't know, potentially, the, thus far the um, the dragons have kind of been... A bit eh. Uh, we have Inferno of the Star Mounts, and this one does have flavour text. The Ancient Dragon. Oh, damn it. This does have a name, and I haven't. One second. In. Va. In. Venaro. In. It. Him has earned his fiery nickname. Who is. Um. That character? <laughs> so. Um, his name I won't try and yeah. say. So, uh. Invenaro. Is uh thank you. Is is a he's a he's a he's a red dragon. Um, his only real inclusion that I could find digging into it was from that Dragons of Faerun supplement. He's a red dragon. Red dragons are the most um uh, arrogant and prideful of the chromatic dragon types. They're the most the ones that most emulate their dragon goddess of Tiamat. Uh, they are really angry and big, and they breathe fire. And at this point, I'm just listing stuff I know about red dragons. Um. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. I'm sure that someone in the comments will be like, oh, actually, this character appeared in second edition and there's a whole book about it. And that's fair. We can't we can't know it all. If, if, um, I, if, if there is a comment that finds something that he's in, I would love to know because I could not find anything. Moving on to Zalto, Fire Giant Duke. So, uh, Zalto is uh, he, he makes a brief appearance in the uh, module I mentioned before, the Storm King's Thunder. 
uh, as one of the yeah. sort of giant representatives of of the re- of the various giant uh, giant kinds. Giant society is uh, a hierarchical situation divided by the ordning. The ordning effectively determines the place that each giant has within it. Uh, at the very bottom is the hill giants. At the very top is the storm giants. Fire giants rank about a middling in the ordning. Uh, his biggest thing, his biggest appearance, I would say, as like as a uh, representation within the universe, is the fact that he appears on the cover of the fifth edition player's handbook. Yeah, I mean, I think as well, if he's gonna be, if he's on the cover of the like the uh, the player's handbook, I think it's it makes thematic sense that when you combat, when he is like dealt damage, you get to venture into the dungeon because in a way. When you pick up the like the fifth edition player's handbook for the first time, and you go like, oh, "I'm gonna fight this character." In order to do that, you have to venture into D and D. You got to venture into the book almost. I think maybe that's like a link to there. Uh, it's a bit of a metaphor. I like it. It's a, a cool metaphorical metaphor. idea that like he's the he's the character that first draws people's eyes. Like, oh, the player's handbook. Does it? That looks so cool on the front there. I want to read that book and make a character from this now. Uh, speaking of potentially uh recognizable characters we have zario the archduke archduke of avernus i believe i don't know because she has a flail in the way zariel is uh she is you can kind of guess maybe from the picture a little bit here she's a fallen angel she was yes. uh basically at the um that as i mentioned before the as the asmodeus trial i guess the best way to play it to say it is his big trial in front of primus and and, and the mechanus and uh with all the angels um she was there and um she got like really basically she got really annoyed that everyone was just sort of sitting around talking and stuff because she was like we should just fight him like the devils are right there we'll just go beat them up right now and i was like no that's not what we do we're the good guys and so she got real pissy about it and asmodeus was like oh yeah She's going to fall. Um, and she did. Asmodeus turned her into the... Uh, well, Hell basically pushed her onto the path to be the Archduke of Avernus and to uh, effectively push out the previous ruler of Avernus. Effectively, Avernus is the plane of warfare because Avernus is the uh, first link towards uh, uh, the basically where everything comes through when it comes to the Nine Hells. Uh, especially the plane where most of the time the abyssal demons invade in their massive massive thing called the blood war which is the massive war between devils and demons uh, to see who gets to control that layer because demons are just chaotic they just invade anything they can find and there's an easy path into for them into the nine hells and there is some theory that goes into this that Morden Kynan was actually involved in trying to ensure that she ended up falling because he foresaw that she would be useful to maintain the balance between the Abyss and the Nine Hells. Uh, that only her sort of rulership and uh, martial knowledge would be uh, able to keep the devils winning that fight. Her abilities kind of make sense for like all that adding up. Like her giving, uh, giving powers to people. Ultimately, her whole deal is she is the commander of... Uh, Hell's armies on that plane. She is like every person that, and then that, that, that this all ties into like the second ability of creating devil tokens. Because when um, when uh, people die, oftentimes they are first they turn into uh, a thing called lemures, which are basically just like this blobby mess of a like soul that's just like an evil. It, it's an evil like blob creature. Um, but then after that, they end up transforming into uh, one of the various sort of low-tier devils that then goes to Avernus and has a stint in Avernus fighting under Zariel. Uh, it's normally what most things do. And her, she is the one that does like the most amount of deals, especially with like martial characters, because she needs to fund this war. And they just need bodies, mostly. They just need lots and lots of bodies for this endless war with creatures that just reform from nothing, effectively. So, like, that's that's sort of her big deal there. Uh, is, is doing that thing. And then like her, you know, at the end of the combat phase, having another combat phase. But I think that too, she is a very martial-centered character in the lore, as far as it goes. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about Zariel. She's really fascinating. And Avernus is a really, really cool uh, uh, cool layer, especially because it can feature a lot in like player character like uh, campaigns. Um, because it's the first layer, so you actually can go there quite a lot. And there are actually quite a few models where you go there as well. So like, she features in a lot of things. Like, she is all over the show. And then I said, no, 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 Mr. Landlord. I love having no running water in my bathroom. In fact, I think I'm going to pay you more rent this year. Ha ha ha. Oh, hello there. 
I hope you're in- Oh Jesus. I hope you're enjoying this video, but I know what you're going to enjoy even more, and that's the sponsor of this video, Bespoke. Their website being Bespoke Post, Dot com. That's the that's the name of the website. Bespoke is the name of the company. Bespoke Post is the name of the website. K -k -k cow. Bespoke is a free to join monthly membership club where they deliver you incredible boxes of wonderful goodies from under the radar brands. And ninety percent of the things in the box are come from small businesses. That's saving my middle America. You take a little quiz. To, you know, let let them know what you're all about. Do you like booze? Do you like knives? Do you like women? Ugh. Then they'll send you a box filled with goodies tailored to your needs. And if you don't if you don't want the box, you can have a look at the box beforehand. And you can say, nah, not today. It's hassle free. It's it's has it's hassle free, baby. Don't hassle. Don't even hassle about this. With an ever-changing lineup of boxes, there is something in bespokepost.com that will fit your fancy. Be it a knife be it bar equipment, be it camping equipment, be it a knife, be it slippers, be it a notepad that also has a knife. And if you use the promo code SPICE20 at checkout by clicking the link in the description, then you can get 20% off your first box from bespokepost.com. Thank you for sponsoring this video. Go have a box. If you want it's time for us to talk about uh, some of the most significant and direct references to D&D uh, &D aspects within this set. And they don't actually appear on any card in this set, but more so on sort of tokens. I am of course referring to the three dungeons that you can explore in this set. Each of these dungeon cards, um, or tokens rather, are direct references to uh, three specific and individual adventures that you can actually go on in D&D, &D, each of them having their own handbook. Uh, and of course, it kind of goes without saying, but trying to fit 300 plus page handbooks onto a bit of card around the size of a child's hand is is going to be a bit of a Herculean task. So naturally, a lot of corners have been cut, a lot of uh, nuance has been lost, but I want to see just how well each of these individual tokens capture the feeling of the dungeons they're supposed to be representing. So let's kick straight off with... Tomb of Annihilation! The Tomb of the Nine Gods, which is the titular tomb in the Tomb of Annihilation adventure, does indeed begin with a false and booby-trapped entrance, which I believe shoots poison darts at anybody who tries to enter it, causing everybody in the party to lose life. And the beginning of this card causes all players to lose one life. Bish, bash, boom, there we go, perfectly flavorful. Let's move on to the next run. Here the card splits into two, choose your own adventure, choose your own path, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, but we're going to go down the right hand side into the Veils of Fear, which is a reference to a specific room in the Tomb of the Nine Gods. This is a, and also spoilers for all of these adventures, uh, by the way, I probably should have said that right at the start. But if you enter this room, you'll see it are lavish with tapestries depicting debauchery and feasts that grow more opulent and twisted as you continue down this room. And if you manage to make it to the end and you pull down the final curtain, uh, you'll be confronted with the severed head of a boar. And then you have to try and resist the charm of this severed head. And if you don't, your player character has to put its head inside the mouth of the boar at which point the ball will bite down on that head, dealing it 4d10 slashing damage for every time it bites. Uh, the 4d10 slashing damage obviously is a little bit more uh, severe than just losing two life, and I guess the discarding a card is kind of an allegory for the fact that uh, the, the boar head kind of makes you lose your mind a little bit, so you have to kind of choose between losing your mind or, uh, or like, having like mental fortitude enough to not lose your mind and just taking a bunch of damage. It's not the cleanest reference, but I'm just glad that we don't, we don't get to see that boar head represented because that, that would be the horrible and gnarly and I'm not here for it. Our next room down this corridor is the sand pit trap, which I think is a reference to the earth cell, which is a room on the fourth floor, which is this 
uh, quite small cube of a room that slowly fills up with sand up until a point, and then the floor opens out from under you, revealing two massive stone rollers uh, that you will fall into and probably be crushed to death by unless you find a hidden switch. And I think both of these aspects, the sort of the sand falling away and also the massive amount of bludgeoning damage that you might take, is here perfectly represented in the sacrifice of a land or the, again, loss of life. The other path uh, that takes you to the end of this adventure is, of course, the oubliette, which is uh, a shortcut, ostensibly, you know. Instead of going down two rooms, you can just go to the oubliette and then immediately afterwards you get to the end of the adventure. And this oubliette is, of course, another part of the Temple of the Nine Gods, and it is a... It's not quite a shortcut, but it's the room that you as the adventurer will end up in if you try and take a shortcut through the tomb. If you ever try and teleport in the Tomb of the Nine Gods, you will always end up in the Oubliette, which is this horrible, horrible room with a really nasty boy in it and a massive devil's face on the wall that has two levers on it. And if you pull the wrong lever, the mouth will open up and eat you and all your trinkets and probably the horrible monster as well. And not only is this massive loss of stuff very much represented in the mechanics of this room with you losing a land, a creature, an artifact and having to discard a card, uh, but the fact that you can only get to the oubliette in D&D if you try and do a shortcut and the way that you get to the oubliette in this card by doing a shortcut, trying to get to the end room much faster than you would otherwise, I think is wonderfully flavorful. And I forgot to say all of that in the original shoot for some reason, hence why I'm currently recording this on my phone. And finally, Cradle of the Death God is our final room, and it is in this room that you summon a token called the Atropole, which is a 4-4 black god creature token with death touch. However, this last chamber in the dungeon is probably the most inaccurate representation of this actual chamber in the D&D adventure of the same name. Uh, the Atropole, for example, is much less a god and more a uh, malformed undead creation of a god. Uh, additionally, it having death touch is a fine keyword for it to have. It does uh, have necrotic damage based around its literal touch, so that does make sense. However, there are a number of other uh, keywords that this creature token could have had. For example, uh, the Atropos Life Drain ability would have suited Life Link as a keyword to a T. And additionally, and I think this is uh, the one that I am most annoyed by, uh, the Atropos can literally only fly. Uh, not that it has the ability to fly, as in it can only fly. It cannot walk. It has a, a walking speed of zero feet. It can only hover in the air. And maybe getting a 4-4 death touch or lifelink flyer a creature token for the cost of you and your opponent losing five life apiece may have been a little bit too powerful for this dungeon, but I just feel that out of all of the keywords this token could have had, flying would have been the best one, and death touch is right down with, I don't know, fucking trample, because technically it can hit two things at once, you know? Our next adventure is Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which has a lot of rooms! All right, let's not beat around the bush. First room, let's go Yawning Portal. When I first saw this on the dungeon card, I was a little bit confused as to why it gained you a life, seeing as portals are usually something that you use to move places. Uh, but it is not a literal portal. The Yawning Portal is the name of an inn that sits atop this uh, vast sort of inverted tower that you descend through in your adventure. And what better way to represent a fantasy inn in a dungeon card than with the gain of a single life as you knock back a fantasy ale, relax in your fantasy bubble bath and throw your fantasy side eyes towards the inevitable player who decides to either try and fuck the barmaid or have a fight with the barman. Or try and fuck the barman and have a fight with the barmaid. Anything is possible in the world of magic. Our next room is dungeon level uh, and I'm actually going to lump this in with the other 
to uh, levels, as it were, in this adventure, where you have, uh, was it the Lost Level and the Deep Mines. These are all names of uh, certain locations within the adventure, and I think that what these uh, levels are supposed to represent with their uh, increasing scry is you delving deeper and deeper into the dungeon of the Mad Mage, discovering more about the lore and about the uh, the nature of the foe that you're going to face. Your uh, knowledge of this place increases as does uh, the depth to which you are entering, as does the scry that you receive. The next room, Goblin Bazaar, creates you a treasure token, which is a perfectly apt representation of what your player character might get up to in this location in the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, but I am bitterly disappointed uh, that the uh, very famous and beloved character Copper the Shaved Dwarf does not appear on any kind of legendary token in this section of the map. Uh, uh, furious, I would even go, go so far as to say. Uh, livid, even. If you don't pick to go down into the Goblin Bazaar, you can instead go into the Twisted Caverns, uh, which is not quite how this adventure works. Uh, the Goblin Bazaar is a section on a much earlier level, and the Twisted Caverns is an entire segment of this adventure. You can't really choose to skip it, but, you know, like, again, some nuance must be lost. The effect on this card, um, a creature not being able to attack you, uh, doesn't really have any specific... Uh, or find any specific ground in uh, a particular element of this location, but just looking at the map of this level makes me feel lost and I'm not going anywhere. So that particularly for me at least captures what it feels like to, to gaze upon the Twisted Caverns. Runestone Caverns is next, and again, whilst there isn't a specific part of this level which this uh, exiling effect seems to be referencing, uh, the caverns themselves are humming with all manner of weird magic. Uh, indeed, there's a section of this level in the adventure just called Weird Magic, and so having a uh, slightly uh, spooky, sl spooky? Having this magical, semi-random draw a card effect attached on this level feels very apt, even if it is not a very specific reference. Muriel's Graveyard is another room in this dungeon card, and this to me is one of the strangest choices, I think, across all of the different dungeons, as this uh, section seems to combine the character of, uh, sorry, Muirel, who is uh, the erstwhile human uh, bodyguard and soldier of the Mad Mage in question who has turned himself into a scorpion, you know, as you do, and the location of Trobrian's graveyard, which is a magical scrap heap of sorts, which is littered with the uh, refuse and failed experiments of the mad metal mage Trobriand. Additionally, the effect of this section of the dungeon card uh, seems to be kind of out of place. Uh, there is indeed a skeleton on the level that you find Muirel on, and the game indeed does say that uh, Muirel himself, the scorpion boy, did animate it, but spiders are a far more common mob, far more common occurrence on this level than skeletons. Indeed, uh, the section of this dungeon card summons more skeletons than exist on the entire of that level uh, in the Dungeon of the Mad Mage's adventure. I don't know. I I just want to see. I just want to see more applications of the of the Lolf spider tokens. I love the I love those baby boys. I love ma 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 kisses kisses for all of their many legs. And finally, the effects of the Mad Wizard's Lair, the final room in this dungeon and final section of this adventure, pretty closely match uh, the uh, events that you would encounter uh, when you go and fight the Mad Wizard Halar Black Cloak at the end of this journey. Obviously, Black Cloak is an incredibly powerful wizard being able to cast any number of different spells, um, but he has also spent his maddened existence uh, setting up a very complicated network of portals and summoning circles throughout his dungeon where he can uh, summon and purge monsters at various different levels uh, pretty much at will. And so the effects 
of this section of the dungeon card, your drawing of three cards uh, and casting of one of them for free, could well be a reference to how uh, the Mad Mage himself uh, can either summon a creature through one of his many portals or simply cast a very powerful spell at you and your party, uh, which is I think a, a wonderfully bombastic way to end uh, such a long and perilous journey, both in terms of the adventure itself and also in terms of how many rooms you have to go through on this card to get to the end. Uh, sorry, our final dungeon is the Lost Minds of Fandelver, uh, but I was just looking at my script um, and in it it's got our final dungeon is the Lost Minds of Fandelver and this one is a and then in brackets uh, in square brackets, I've got doozy slash let down, and then in rounded brackets, remove as necessary. Uh, so I'm really glad that I, again, proofed my script uh, before I sat down to record. Uh, and I'm also glad that I uh, somehow managed to predict the cleave mechanic months ahead of schedule. The first room is a cave entrance, uh, which indeed there is an entrance to a cave in this adventure. And it's a mechanic of scrying one, at least to me, uh, feels the most sort of like starting of an adventure um, of any of the, uh, the dungeon cards, beginning with uh, looking into the future or like trying to discern some information, peering your head into the darkened mouth of a cave not being sure what you're going to find, is perfectly uh, and aptly represented in this singular scry. The next room is Goblin Lair, where you can recruit a friendly 1-1 goblin, Red Lad. We love to see it. Uh, although if I am going to nitpick, and, and let's be honest, the entire reason that you are still watching this video is because for some reason, you enjoy uh, viewing me being incredibly anal about uh, d and Magic the Gathering themed cards. Uh, this is not the section of the adventure, the Goblin Lair, is not the section of the adventure where you can recruit a goblin into your party. That happens at a very different section of this adventure where you find a goblin that has been captured and you can choose to free him from his bondage and he can accompany you on your way. And the goblin has a name, wizards. It's called Droop. And why wasn't Droop given a legendary token in this section? First Copper and now Droop. Do you have a problem? Do you have a problem with, uh, with, with, with fucking JOY! Nothing but respect for my short kings! We then run into a series of three rooms and this, I will also say this is the card whose formatting I like the most. Uh, I like the fact that if you choose one path in this card, it does lock you out of one of the rooms on the sort of like the far opposite side of the adventure. I just think that's uh, I just think that's fun. Storeroom is our first room uh, on this list of three, uh, and there are indeed storerooms in the Lost Minds of Fandelva. Uh, although there are only two storerooms in the entire adventure that have anything inside them uh, that could be uh, counted as useful items that could constitute a plus one plus one counter uh, and they are either a flagon of dwarvish whiskey or uh, some dwarvish armor from an NPC that you could just uh, steal and not give back to him. Uh, so canonically if you choose to get a plus one plus encounter on one of your creatures uh, by going through this room you are either uh, stealing somebody's clothes and then jamming them onto them or you're getting them blasted out of their mind. The dark pool and the fungal cavern I kind of want to talk about at the same time. I feel that these two effects should be swapped around. In the adventure of course there are there is a dark pool and there is a, a fungal cavern However, uh, the fungal cavern is much more inclined to uh, cause some kind of harm uh, to an opponent uh, by sort of uh, filling their mouth with um, horrible fungal spores and damaging them like that. And the dark pool is something that is very difficult to navigate. It doesn't have any kind of damage based effects unless you are being drowned in the dark pool. Uh, but it is very difficult to see through it. Uh, I feel like swapping these two mechanics over would have made a lot more sense. And finally, our final room, the Temple of Damathian, simply draws you a card. Uh, now, at the end of this adventure, uh, you do uncover some secret maps and some uh, evil deeds being perpetrated by some fucking guy. Uh, Nazar, of course he's called Nazar. What an evil fucking name. You do indeed uncover Nazar's maps, gaining some knowledge about what this uh, evil character was planning on doing in this temple, uh, what, what his scheme was, thus 
drawing you a card, but also just generally the idea of ending an adventure by drawing a card. Kind of like how in Munchkin you uh, defeat a creature and draw a loot card, or uh, having the uh, having the, the full rules text of a magical item that you've just uh, looted from a dragon's trove and cast the identify spell on being passed to you by your DM. Uh, that's what the draw card at least to me feels like. It feels like a solid reward for completing a adventure. And those are all of the dungeons. They are overall pretty good. There are a couple of inconsistencies, but as I said at the start, most of these adventures are at bare minimum, like over 50 pages long, and at maximum, the size of a pretty substantial novel. Uh, so trying to fit all of the nuance and details and itty bitty machinations into all of these cards, it would have been completely unfeasible, but both physically and also mentally to do that. Uh, but unfortunately, I have to throw all of the dungeon cards in the bin because, of course, Droop and Copper should have been given legendary 1-1 creature tokens. Aha! Unlike my wizard cosplay, I didn't forget to buy green face paint. Look who's the idiot now! Circle of Dreams Druid is our first green card, and as good as this card is mechanically, I don't really understand why this is a Circle of Dreams Druid and not another uh, Circle Druid. For example, Circle of Lands. The mechanics of this card would have suited a Circle of Lands Druid a lot more from my perspective, both for the case that lands in magic are closely tied to mana production, but also from the case that the Circle of Lands Druid has access to certain cantrips like Commune with Nature and Insect Plague, which are a lot more closely tied with the idea of increasing power based on the number of creatures available. Uh, what I just said there is uh, not entirely correct. Um, I said that a Circle of the Land Druid gets access to more cantrips which are more closely linked with the idea of communing with nature. Uh, that's not correct. What I was thinking uh, was that uh, if you pick a Circle of the Land Druid because you get access to uh, a whole range of spells sort of on the side of the d and uh, manual for Circle of the Land Druid, it lists all of the different spells you have. Uh, in my tired brain, uh, I thought that meant that those spells were uh, locked away from every other druid. That is not at all the case. Uh, for example, the ninth level, um, uh, if you get it to ninth level and you're a Circle of the Land Druid and you pick Grasslands as your biome, uh, in the book it says you get access to the Insect Plague spell. Uh, but that's a spell that you can already take at fifth level, um, it's just, it just means that if you hit ninth level as that particular biome of a Circle of the Lands Druid, you get that spell for free in your, uh, in your spell slots, in your learnt spells for the day. It doesn't count towards all the spells that you can know, so it just gives you, um, gives you an extra tool in your arsenal. Uh, but that's not even the, uh, most important part of, uh, the Circle of the Lands Druid subclass, which makes me think that it would have suited this card a lot better, and that's because of its level 2, um, ability, Natural Recovery. Uh, which allows you, the player, to uh, meditate effectively, have a short rest, commune with nature, and regain a lot more of your magical energy that, than you would do normally. Uh, and that, I think, ties perfectly in with uh, the mechanics of this card, which uh, you tap your druid, that's kind of like an allegory for meditation. You check the number of creatures that you control, again, that's kind of an allegory for communing with nature, communing with the surrounding uh, uh, fauna, uh, yeah, the fauna of sort of like where you are at the moment. And then you regain magical energy. This card gives you a bunch of mana. Uh, so that's the reason why I think that this card would uh, much better suit a circle of the land Druid and not a circle of the moon Druid. Back to the video where I'm sure the next card that I'm going to talk about is chock full of interesting analysis and cutting edge nitpicking. Circle of Moon Druid is a bear becomes a bear. Good reference. Frog Hemoth is our next creature that we're going to talk about and this is a monster that you will only ever encounter in Volo's Guide to Monsters, a book that I had to purchase as business expense for this channel. HMRC, HMRC, please give me free money, please. 
I don't really understand what this scavenging ooze on steroids ability is doing on the frog hemoth, which after all in D&D is just a very big frog. And whilst of course that means I love him and he is my friend, I feel that this mechanic would suit a creature like a knight hag or even a, a, a grek or a grell a lot more aptly than a frog behemoth. Um, but that being said, if that meant we didn't get to see the frog hemoth uh, on cardstock, then I'm more than happy to take the Ludo narrative hit and just let him be. Instrument of the Bards is our next card, and the artwork of this card specifically references the Olham or the Olam harp, uh, which is a legendary, nice, bardic instrument that contains a great number of spells that you can cast, such as uh, protection from good and evil, firestorm, and just a whole laundry list of other ones. None of the spells in the harp, however, have any kind of mechanical link to this ability to uh, more easily summon creatures. Uh, however, there are magical uh, bardic instruments, legendary bardic instruments, like the uh, the Froshlikan Bandor, which does contain charges of speak with animals. Uh, so I feel that Instrument of the Bards as a card is very much just trying to capture broadly all of the various magical or legendary instruments that bards may come across in D&D, and potentially also a direct reference to Magic the Gathering's most famous bard, Yisan, who had a very similar ability to this card. Long Rest is the next card we're going to talk about, and this is fantastic. I love that this was one of the references that the team managed to put within the set. Uh, a Long Rest is such an iconic part of any D&D &D adventure, and yet never really gets its own like time to shine as a mechanic. It's just the thing that happens usually between game sessions. Uh, anyone who has played a game of D&D &D knows that when you have a Long Rest, you manage to recover all of your hit points, which is represented by the fact that uh, if you pump enough mana into Long Rest, you get your starting uh, life total back, uh, but also it lets you recover spells, uh, represented here in the fact that you can return cards from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, and the X equaling 8, uh, or sorry, the X having to equal 8 in order for you to get your life points back up to their full total, is itself a reference to the fact that a long rest in D&D specifically requires you to rest for 8 or more hours. It's a delightful little nod. Uh, I think this is a fantastic and jolly good card. Ooh, how cracking. Ochre Jelly is quite an iconic monster from D&D Adventures, uh, and its ability to split into multiple versions of itself is very much found in its mechanics as a D&D &D monster. And also, it was quite a surprise to me that this is the first time that this kind of ooze splitting mechanic has been found across all of Magic the Gathering's various oozes and slimes. There's lots of doubling, but not so much in the way of splitting. I will say there is a little bit of a mechanical disparity in how this ooze splits compared to D&D and Magic. In Magic, the ooze must die, but in D&D, dying doesn't cause an ochre jelly to split. Instead, it just needs to be dealt damage with a slashing damage or lightning damage, weirdly enough, which I've never fully understood, but it's always a lovely surprise when I remember that. Aha, I, I'll hit you, uh, hit the oozes with thunderclap. Sweet, there are now 16 of them. Ah, oh, bollocks. Beautiful times. I will say that I am genuinely quite disappointed that we didn't get our holy trinity in this set. Uh, we've had ochre jelly, we've had gelatinous cube, and unfortunately no black pudding. No black pudding card. One day, one day when we return to adventures in the Forgotten Realms and make it, uh... A fun set to draft. That's when, that's when we'll get Black Pudding. That's what's been missing from this set. Tarask is a very iconic beast for the people who play D&D. Uh, outsiders to the game may look at dragons and liches and gelatinous cubes and stuff like that as iconic monsters, but once you get your teeth into the game, the Tarask is always held up as this uh, behemoth, this, uh, this true pinnacle of a challenge for a Dungeons and Dragons party. Across almost all editions of the game, the Tarask has been featured and is always a force of nature, a nearly unkillable pseudo dinosaur that requires you to use a uh, strategy to lure away from uh, cities, which it will just stomp through and annihilate. Uh, it is throughout most of D&D's history, it is a nearly impossible feat to kill a Tarask. 
which is why it is quite an upsetting thing uh, that the Tarask in Magic the Gathering can be killed by, I don't know, fucking this guy. Bit shit, innit? <laughs> the fact that the Tarask has trample, uh, when it attacks, it fights a creature, uh, it all, that all makes sense. Uh, the Ward 10 as well is obviously a reference to the fact that the Tarask not only has, uh, resistance to a lot of magical effects, but also the fact that it has a ridiculously high armor class. Um, but I know that for a lot of D&D players, this version of the Tarask in Magic the Gathering was seen as a bit of a disappointment. Uh, in fact, I know that Pleasant Kenobi, uh, made an entire video about his disappointment over the Tarask. Uh, however, as I believe he said in that video, or at least he said to me, like, off camera, um, this could well be a actual reference to the fact that the 5th edition Tarask, uh, the Tarask that currently exists in the most recent version of D&D, is in of itself a massive disappointment. The 4th edition Tarask, the Tarask that existed in 4th edition, had over 1,500 hit points and an AC, an armor class, of 35. However, in 5th edition, the Tarask was massively nerfed. Its hit points fell to just over 700 and its AC was reduced to 25. Meaning that uh, you all you'd need is a plus five to hit or plus six to hit and you could hit a Tarask uh, on a 19, which is a completely feasible thing for a lot of classes to achieve, not too late into their campaigns. With that in mind, the fact that the Tarask Magic the Gathering card is a disappointment is Again, a meta reference to the fact that the Taraskin 5th edition is itself a massive disappointment. I've just justified the Tarask being bad for you. I hope you're happy. And the final green card we're going to talk about today is Wild Shape, which is a spell in Magic the Gathering that changes one of your creatures into another creature, or, or a spell in D&D which allows its caster to change into any creature under a certain challenge rating. Uh, and that is an important thing to note. All creatures in D&D have a certain challenge rating. They go all the way um, down from uh, a quarter all the way up to like challenge rating 30 or something like that. And challenge ratings are a genuinely significant thing to consider uh, when we look at this card. Uh, a highest level, at its highest level, Wild Shape allows its caster to transform into a creature with challenge rating 1 or less. Uh, which, if we look at Wild Shape the card, absolutely, turtles on that list. Uh, so are spiders of all different kinds of sizes, but most significantly, not elephants. Elephants have a challenge rating of 4 in 5th edition. What makes this even more peculiar to me is the fact that there are a whole host of creatures in Magic that you can absolutely transform into using Wild Shape, um, whose stat line is kind of set at a 3 3. Uh, for example, elephants, yes, are 3 3 tokens in most of their iterations, but so are beast tokens, and so are elk tokens. Um, it seems very strange for the designers to have gone out of their way to pick a creature type that you cannot transform into using Wild Shape, when creature types that you can absolutely do exist at this stat level. My only explanation that I can think of uh, is the fact that I was genuinely onto something uh, with the Power and Toughnesses video that I made and the Elk Conspiracy that's going on at Wizards of the Coast, and this is their way of shutting me down from the inside. We're now moving on to the green cards, and our first one uh, is Eliwick Tumblestrum. Now, I said we wouldn't cover the, uh, the characters that were sort of created for the set, but apparently, according to you, there are there's some additional lore about Eliwick. The Eliwick Tumblestrum that you are seeing here is nothing like the brief lore appearance that she she got uh, within D and D previous to this final this appearance here. The only the link to Eliwick Tumblestrum, Tumblestrum that I could find was effectively a very brief mention within a web supplement. Uh, within the wizards.com D&D 3.5 archive of ar articles uh, for the Player's Handbook 3.5 edition. Uh, in that, she is a cleric of uh, the gnome god, um, who is uh, uh, Gal Glittergem, uh, who's all about uh, you know trickery and deceiving and, and getting, uh, getting that fat cash. 
I think what's happened here, from what I, all I can read, is that basically they 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 they've seen that like initial like mention of Eliwick there, and they've gone okay. Because if you read the law for Eliwick Thomas from that they that uh, they've put out themselves, she found a deck of many things and made a wish to become the best bard of all time, like the the most legendary bard ever. Her abilities are basically like designed for like doing dungeons as like a planeswalker which makes sense because she's part of like the dungeon party that they've made up for this set finding that out i was like okay this answers some questions but it raises more questions like firstly why is she even in the party in the first place she is incredibly more powerful than almost anyone in that like in in the party that she's with like all the rest of them are like people who probably like are like desperately fighting for their lives and she's like like her fucking like law thing that was really up was like saying like how she was like uh she was uh she'd like bested like a demon prince she'd infatuated angels or like she'd like done like she's like she's like messed with like all these like super powerful creatures and she's like out here chilling with a small party or something i'm like this is just weird if you're an all-powerful like creature the chaotic little creature like this like i guess maybe it makes sense that you just be like i'm just gonna bounce around and parties for a bit like what else am i gonna do here i'm just gonna vibe another legendary character in green who we're moving on to is old norbone and this is the penultimate i believe legendary dragon we're going to be discussing the flavor text here, the ancient dragon cut- Oh, for God's sake! Um, I'm not even going to try it. The, the ancient green dragon cow is often seen with a mangled corpse dangling from her mouth. What? Hello. First off, can you please pronounce whatever the um, <laughs> that's supposed to be? So, uh, Kogi, uh, Kogi Yiliamato. Perfect. How do you, how can you do this so easily? Yes, Kogi. Kogi Yiliamato. Cloggy Kloyamata. That sounds Welsh. I should be able to do it, but fuck it, I can't. Okay, what's the what's the fucking news on this green bastard? So, so Old Norbone um, is a uh, adult green dragon that appears within the Storm King's Thunder again, which is a module they use quite a bit actually for this set. I wasn't expecting to do that, but it's another dragon that appears in that that you can go and beat up and kill if you want to. It also appeared originally within yet again. You might be able to guess it. It's the dragons of Faerun. Apart from that, they don't do a whole lot. They're they're a green dragon, and it's actually kind of a shame that they don't really get into this uh, into this a whole lot. So, because green dragons are actually uh, they are the most uh, trickster of them all. Basically, they're the most deceiving. Uh, their whole deal mm. normally is um, that they like to um, create illusions or to uh, to fester in people's minds and sort of like push them towards being their like uh, being their like pets or servants. Um, uh, they don't like to normally fight. They're fighting. They will fight if they need to. It's it's really sad that they like condensed it down to this. This doesn't really do a service. Also, and I've realised it just now. Looking at the character, there is no way that a green dragon should be more powerful than a red dragon. Green dragons are like the second weakest of the chromatic dragons. Just just stronger than like white dragons red dragons should by far be the strongest biggest numbers because they are the biggest strongest boys in the chromatic dragon array and there we go we have done we have done all of our green cards Woo! let us now move on to our colorless boys Ooh. and for the colorless cards I'm, I'm putting clothes back on i couldn't think of a good outfit for uh talking about colorless cards so we're, we're bringing it full circle I do have something written uh, on my chest under this, but that's for me and God to know, and for you to, you to just imagine. It's a massive deck of many things as our first colourless card, and it's... fine? Hello, once again, spicy people of the internet. I am going to be removing all of my deck of many things analysis and hot take from this video, or at least the one that I um, had filmed, because I make some claims in that section where I'm like, oh, I don't really know what cards these are supposed to, supposed to represent. It's not made particularly clear. And then I actually, in the editing booth, look at the footage, and you can see the three cards in the artwork for the deck of many things that 
that's supposed to be reflected in the mechanics of the card. So I just look like an absolute buffoon. Uh, the three cards that are represented, first off, if you don't know what the Deck of Many Things is, it's a very powerful and rare magical artifact in D&D uh, that works kind of like um, a literal tarot deck, a material tarot deck, in that when you draw a card from the tarot deck, it usually, you know, gives you an omen. With the Deck of Many Things, if you draw a card from the tarot deck, it will give you a very specific material effect. Uh, there are lots of negative ones, there are lots of positive ones. Never give the deck of many things to your adventuring party. It will completely derail your campaign. Anyway, the three cards that this um, card is representing in its mechanics, the first one, if you roll a 1 to a 9, you get a random card back from your graveyard. This is a reference uh, or an allegory, mechanical allegory, for the sun card, where if you draw that from the deck of many things on top of getting a bunch of experience, uh, you also get a random wondrous item, uh, decided at random, uh, which is, again, you get a random card back from your graveyard, you get a random wondrous item. That's a pretty clear allegory. The next one is the Jester card, and this one is an even tighter fit. Uh, when you draw the Jester card from the Deck of Many Things, you draw two cards from the Deck of Many Things. When you draw the Jester card, or sorry, when you activate the Jester portion of this card, you draw two cards from your deck. That's perfectly clean. That that allegory was just probably the easiest thing that any game Sonic has ever thought up. Uh, and the final one is, of course, the skull. Now, this is the least tight allegory or mechanical translation. That the way that the skull card works in the deck of many things in D&D &D is when you draw it, it summons a avatar of death next to the drawer, uh, and the drawer then must fight the avatar of death on their own. If anyone tries to help, they summon their own avatar of death, uh, and the avatar of death will not stop until it is defeated. Um, and if it is not defeated, if it defeats uh, the drawer of the card, that player cannot return to life. They are fully dead. They can't be revivified. Anything. It's kind of like a disintegrate. Um, so that is uh, that. Oh, those are the three cards. Um, the fourth card that I think this uh, card is actually trying to represent actually can be found in sort of its mechanical allegory in the activation ability of the deck of many things. When you activate the deck of many things in Magic the Gathering, you roll a d20 and then you subtract uh, your the cards in your hand, the number of cards you have in your hand, from that dice roll. And if it's zero or below, you then discard your entire hand. I think this is a mechanical allegory for drawing the idiot card, uh, which if you draw it, you roll a d4 and then you remove that number plus one from your total intelligence uh, stat forever. Um, which I think is quite uh, quite a good allegory. Uh, the quite uh, it would be a quite a good allegory if that is indeed what this mechanic is trying to represent. For the fact that you have to discard your card if you roll poorly on the dice, uh, in the same way that if you roll poorly on the metaphorical dice of what card you draw from the deck of many things, you will also draw a terrible card like the idiot. Uh, so that's my analysis of the deck of many things um, presented late at night uh, in a very echoey room with really bad facial hair. As a little addendum to this, however, I really do enjoy how various cards within the deck of many things appear throughout other cards uh, in this set. Uh, for example, the gem card appears in Unexpected Windfall, which absolutely uh, links up with how the gem card works uh, in D&D. I think Sudden Insight, the card, is supposed to be showing us what happens when you do draw uh, the Vizier card. We even have flavor text talking about um, a question being answered. And Fate's Reversal is, of course, representing how the Fate card works, uh, reversing a tragic event. Uh, I love all of these little little Easter eggs within a highly referential set, and weirdly enough, these little moments scratch my flavour itch a lot more than the actual card, the deck of many things, um, which is, is disappointing, but at the same time, also quite cool. 50 Feet of Rope is also in this set, and you might be thinking that this is a particularly peculiar card for me to decide to dedicate some time to talking about, especially seeing as I just did a whole big old song about all of the cards that I, I couldn't analyse. But I wanted to take this moment not only to say that I love the versatility of this card, but also how that versatility very much reflects the often unused and forgotten 50 feet of rope that most players will begin with in their starting packs as a starting 
character. I cannot tell you the amount of times that I have either run or been in one shots where characters have access to literally 50 feet of rope. And if there's four of them, that's 200 feet of rope between them and not used it in uh, at moments where it would have been super useful. You can tie up a creature, you can traverse down a, a, a hole, you can throw it over a wall and climb over it. You can do everything with 50 feet of rope. And fuck walls! Fuck them in their stupid little faces! Wait, faces? Ah! Treasure chest and mimic I want to talk about at the same time, and that's because one of these cards I love and the other one I kind of hate? The treasure chest is an utter delight of a card. Uh, mechanically, it's terrible. You can sink seven mana into this card and lose three life and that be it. Or you could tinker out an artifact for a one in 20 chance. Never play with this card. This is a terrible, terrible decision to ever play this card. But there's some soft part of me that can't help but look at the D20 rolling treasure chest in the Dungeons and Dragons Magic the Gathering set and and just feel satisfied. Even if the vast majority of treasure chests that you'll find in uh, dungeons and adventures, even ones that are, are homebrewed and ones that you'll find in uh, handbooks, uh, even though the majority of the loot that you'll find in the treasure chest is going to be predetermined and not down to a dice roll, there's just something, oh, there's just something about the D20 rolling dice chest. What, what can I say? I'm a big softy. The Mimic card, however, just does not sit with me right, uh, especially in comparison to the Treasure Chest card. I love how the artwork for both of these cards are drawn by the same artist, but for me, the scariest thing about Mimics is that they are literally indistinguishable uh, from everyday objects, be it a chest, a trapdoor, a chair. Mimics are supposed to be exact mimicries of the things that they're supposed to be mimicking. And so the fact that the Mimic card both aesthetically and also mechanically shares very little similarity with the treasure chest is kind of a, I don't know, kind of a, a swing and a miss for me. Like just looking at it mechanically, the Mimic ought to have the same mana value as the treasure chest or to have the same rarity as the treasure chest. In my opinion, I would have loved to have seen these cards merged into one. Uh, I would love to have seen the treasure chest instead of having its lowest dice roll just causing you to lose life, obviously a reference to the fact that treasure chests uh, can become, uh, uh, what you call it, trapped. Um, I would have loved to have seen uh, the treasure chest, if you roll a nat 1, become a 3-3 three, three shapeshifter and then given to an opponent. Uh, it becomes a mimic. I think that would have been really quite a fun and uh, slightly more subtle uh, reference to the fact that mimics are indeed hiding in plain sight and are indeed literally indistinguishable from treasure chests fooled with treasure and treasure chests that are not fucking treasure chests at all. Would it have made this card even less playable? Absolutely. Would it have made me happy? No. Hive of the Eye Tyrant is next. Whilst most of the animated lands in this set are more references to the feel of an adventure as opposed to direct references to adventures themselves, Hive of the Eye Tyrant has a couple of extra little small references tucked away there. First off, this card could well be a direct reference to uh, the Eye Trilogy of Adventures uh, from 2nd Edition, which saw you uh, fighting a Beholder right at the end as the big bad boss. But this isn't the most interesting reference that I think that this card contains. Uh, I'd like to point your attention to the alternate art of this card, for example. There's a lot of alternate arts in this set of different characters and also uh, different lairs and different lands and stuff like that. Uh, but the alternate art of this card uh, actually is a direct reference to the very first visual depiction of a beholder as it appeared uh, in D&D media on the cover of this Greyhawk supplement. Uh, notice uh, the uh, amount of eyes, the positioning of the character and indeed the armour uh, that the human is wearing. Now on to the multicolour cards and we've been recording for uh, an hour and 20 so I might I might ask for a speed run up to a degree. Um, so, Baron of Clan Un Under, is this like, is this like just kind of a generic cleric stand-in or is this an actual proper creature? Uh, unfortunately, it's the former. 
Um, Barrowin, as far as the mentions involves, they are involved in a lot of the side game stuff, the uh, idle game, uh, the board game, actually, the D &D, one of the D&D board games, they appear in that one. Um, and they have a character sheet on the D&D website. As far as lore goes, they're basically linked. They don't appear in anything to it, but they're linked to Icewind Dale, that setting, um, which is the northern part of Faerun, effectively, and where the game Icewind Dale was set. And also where a lot of Drift to Urden stuff happens is up there as well. Um, apart from that, though, they basically are... They're a cleric. They're, they, their abilities are basic cleric abilities. What about Bruinor Battlehammer? His flavour text is... <clears throat> Knew I'd find ye in trouble if I came and looked for ye! So, uh, outside of that terrible, terrible accent, again, is this a stand-in or is this an actual character? I was going to, like, if you didn't do the Scottish accent, I'd be like, what are you doing? You, This is D&D, &D. you <laughs> have to do a Scottish accent, it's the dwarves. Um, the rest of this bit is gonna be done in a very bad Scottish accent. <laughs> Alright, I think I can get along with that. Oh, we're gonna upset some people. <laughs> So Bruno Battlehammer is a legendary party member of Dritzdo Erden and is one of the dwarves that sort of helps him out and is one of the dwarves that he finds when he first comes out of the Underdark. And he basically goes way back to the beginning of R.A. Salvatore's like 50 books that he wrote about the character. Because once you get stuck, you can't get out. Basically, he's just like the most badass dwarf around. Like, that's his whole deal. He's a cool badass dwarf. Um, he's just <laughs> awesome. I think that's what like, he's He's... He, like, leads his clan, like, he, like, fights stuff like crazy. He has all these, like, awesome magical items, and he, like, creates magical items too because he's a dwarf. So, like, him being all based around, like, equipment and stuff makes sense because he's all about magical items and whatnot. I can feel in my heart John Duncan uh, cringing and not knowing why just somewhere in the distance on this, on this shit island called home. Uh... The next multicolored creature is, of course, Drizzt Duerden. I have to concede, there is no way you could capture Drizzt Duerden into a single card. We are talking about a man here who has so many books and so many appearances. Like his reference, the reference page for him is like it's 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 in the it's it's in the thousands. Like there is he is everywhere because, like I said beforehand, he's the poster boy. He cemented the idea of the good drought. Because he's from the evil race of Dark Elves I mentioned earlier on. But he broke free from that society. He realised there was something wrong with it. And so he went to the surface and he ended up then becoming a fantastic adventurer and hero. Who's been all over the place. And fought with his awesome crew of people. Of which we've only seen half of in the set and no more of them appear. Which is very sad. I don't know what you were doing. Don't put in half of the awesome adventuring party from R.A. Salvador stuff. And don't and like miss the rest of them. Where's Wolfgar? Where's my boy Wolfgar? But as far as like the set goes... Double strike, he's got two swords, he's a dual wielder, he wields his uh, uh, flame tongue and his frostbrand frost brand weapons. So like, okay cool, he's got two swords, he has double strike. Uh, Gwenivar, the legendary 4-1 green cat creature token, is a yeah. uh, is an item that he actually obtained during the uh, Origin Trilogy series that uh, I have in the corner of my room right now that I'm looking at. He obtained Gwynevar from uh, from this evil drow wizard who was trying to kill him, and he ended up beating up the wizard and taking the taking it, and be like, "You don't deserve this cat." Um, and now Gwynevar <laughs> is like his like best friend who's been there through for him for like since the very beginning of his time in the Underdark and trying to survive in the Underdark, and like has been with him like all the way through, and like like so like him being able to create that creature makes complete sense. They are companions. They are like the yeah. buds. Um, and I think the him gaining power when a creature dies. Uh, his whole thing is he's like it's like a uh, Dragon Ball Z in Goku. Uh, he gets more powerful as the series goes on because he defeats more and more things and, and you know gains in strength, much like a player yeah. character would gain in strength as they increase in levels. Um, ah, uh, Faraday stand in like uh, Barrowin or more uh, legitimate character like Brianna? Uh Far more legitimate. Uh, Faraday cool. is uh, one part of the Brimstone Angels in the same way that Drizzt is the poster boy uh for the good drow dude faraday is the poster girl for the tiefling warlock um she's not evil ah. but she has a dark pact with the person who created her um because she's yeah. a tiefling tieflings have infernal blood um her whole idea of like basically like uh you know when dice roll she gains like 
power from it is is a whole sort of like is matching. It's actually the Dark One's own luck is actually not so much linked to her character as much as it is in fact linked to just like a general the general uh, fiend uh, subclass for warlocks. So she's a cool character, but her abilities don't represent her character whatsoever from the books. Uh, moving on to Gretchen Titchwiller. <laughs> so Gretchen is one of those characters where I looked at it and went, no, th- what? No. Um, the only thing that she appears in, and I only have this because I'm very, very sad, is the uh, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate board game, which is uh, it's a oh. it's a D&D version of, you know, the Betrayal games? Yeah, Betrayal at House on the Hill. Yeah. Yes, it is a D&D variant of that game series. Um, she is one of the playable characters that you can play as in the series, mm. in that in that board game. She's just a druid. That's just Her thing is like she draws cards and it's a land and you put lands because they're druids and they cultivate land and stuff. There's no real character there because it's just a weird reference to a D&D board game that I didn't think anybody but me knew about or owned. Uh, the next one uh, going over Hamar uh, is... Kalein Reclusive Painter. Kalein is a uh, pretty awesome uh, magic uh, vampire, basically, who likes to do paintings and stuff, which, I mean, she's painting stuff in the thing. She appears in the Waterdeep Dragon Heist module. She uh, hates um, the person who uh, created her, so she, she can actually aid you in the heist if you manage to work to get her aid. Uh, her big deal is that her magic comes across when uh, any pictures that she paints come to life. Uh, so they uh, appear out of the painting and they become real. Her ability is kind of like, I feel like the treasure thing maybe matches the whole fact that she's from Dragon, the, the, the heist module that they created. Apart from like that, like there's a fair bit of like stuff in like her backstory from like the module, but not a lot that leads into this character as it is. Like mm. all you really get is the idea from the picture that she is... Um, like a painter and stuff. Although, let me just say this: I just realized I was reading this card. This is ridiculous. They don't mention anywhere on this at all that she's a vampire. Oh yeah, you just said she was a vampire. <laughs> she is a vampire. She's a vampire. I oh. want to make it very clear: she is a vampire. <laughs> all right. Next, we have Cridal of Baldur's Gate, and I'm assuming this is a character from Baldur's Gate. Uh, so Cridal is from the same comic book series, the Baldur's Gate series, that uh, Delina is from, that wild mage from earlier on. He basically, yeah, he's, he's just a badass rogue. He's also a poet. He, like, oh. reads poetry and stuff. Like, he creates poetry during the comic book series. Um, and he sort of, like, is an aid to the character, uh, Delina and whatnot, throughout the story. My notes here just say that he's 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 hot. That's I don't know why I put that in there, but he... He's an attractive dude. Um, thanks, previous me, for that one, I guess. All right. Um, Minsk, beloved ranger. So Minsk and Boo are basically one of the most uh, well-loved and famous characters that came from the uh, Baldur's Gate series. Mm. Uh, which, if you don't know, Baldur's Gate 3 is currently coming out sometime soon and is made by Larian Studios, who are awesome, and you should definitely check it out if you have the time. Yeah. Um, they're not paying me for this. Um, mm. That's just I love the game. Um, and... Uh, basically, Minsk is uh, an amazing character. He's just like this, like really, really nice, lovable dude who I thought was a barbarian at first, and then like then he's got this little hamster called uh, Boo. Boo's the brains of the operations, if you don't know. Um, oh, yeah. And but basically, like he has like there's lines that he has that like has just like entered like D and D meme lore. Basically, I think probably the most <laughs> famous one is Boo. Go for the eyes. Um, <laughs> Which is just him commanding his tiny hamster to just leap at people's eyes, um, because the hamster is awesome. It's just, it's just a cool, it's just a cool character. It's just a really cool character that became famous because it was a big ass brawny dude with a tiny hamster that he fights with. Which obviously that was going to become an internet sensation. Oh, and of course, a fan favorite. Like, there's no way you can put that into a D and D game and not have that become a big deal. He has a hamster. Also, as the his X thing, I think is probably a reference to the fact that one of the spells that a ranger can get uh, is the ability to uh, like increase the size of a, a character, of a person or character, which obviously Mince can use to increase the size of his hamster. 
uh, to make it a giant hamster. A very slight addendum to this section. In doing a little bit of digging on my own just to, you know, put this video together, I uh, stumbled across this article in the Forgotten Realms wiki uh, titled Miniature Giant Space Hamster, um, and I'll read a little bit from it. Uh, according to Minsk, a miniature giant space hamster was a giant space hamster that has been miniaturized. They were identical in size to regular hamsters, and Boo is the only known miniature giant space hamster in Rome space in the 14th century DR and the animal companion of Minsk ever since his first head wound. So the implication of this is that Minsk got hit on the head and for some reason that caused him to believe that Boo is actually a miniaturized giant space hamster. However, the mechanics of this card suggest that that wasn't just the result of uh, cranial trauma, but no, Boo is actually a giant space hamster and Minsk has the power to make Boo a giant space hamster. Uh, so I don't know if that's, that's gonna sit well in terms of like, the Dungeons and Dragons canon, but, um, cool, I guess. This is a weird game. Uh, next, we have Orcus, Prince of Undeath. Um, yes, Orcus is another one of those characters which is one of, like, the most fundamental characters to the entire series. Um, a, a significant amount of bad things that happen is because of Orcus. Uh, Vecna, if you don't know who Vecna is, Vecna is a massively powerful uh lich but basically like orcus is that vegna is like his servant is one of his um uh worshippers and his desire is to transform the entire multiverse into a, a necrotic place where uh everything is perfectly ordered and still because everyone is dead everything that's basically undeath or um anything like that ultimately ties its way back to orcus uh in some way and it kind of like his ability sort of match that desire of him in that case, where like sure you can like make him a creature's weaker, but you lose life for it because he doesn't he doesn't want anyone to live. Fair, and, and then the returning like things to the battlefield very much is just like those creatures being turned into undead as opposed to just like being like. I guess bodies on the floor. Yeah, his his uh the wand of Orcus that he's carrying and the thing that you can uh, is a pl yeah. is an item that you can feasibly get. It's in the um in the book. Uh, basically like lets you uh summon uh undead creatures and he where he where he walks uh necrotic energy follows him and undead creatures rise around him basically. This was the character. This here was the character that like people were getting upset about. Like Christian mums were getting upset about. All right, next we have Shres Shres ah. Uh, Share Shisra. Wow, brain. Shisra. Death's Whisperer. So, uh, this one is going to be very quick. They're completely new for the set. They're they have oh. no lore at all going into them uh, from anything else. Uh, they're just a they they just have warlock invocations and stuff, and they seem to be an undeath war undead warlock, uh, like a warlock of uh, the undying uh, pact looks like. So that's it. There we go. Well, I said we'd barrel through the, the last six because it's, get, it's getting really late. So I guess we'll barrel through. Ta Targ Nar, Demon Fang Knoll is our next card. Uh, so Targ Nar is from the Descent into Avernus module. Um, uh -huh. And their deal is that they are a, uh, a Knoll. That's their thing. Um, Knolls, if you don't know, Knolls are uh, uh, created by uh, one of the Demon Princes. I think it's Gra... Gra... I better look this up. I better look like I know what I'm talking about. Um, oh no, what am I talking about? Stupid me, I know the name. Of course I know the name. It's just locked in my brain. Yenogu. They're from the demon prince Yenogu, the hungerer. Uh, Yenogu basically, like, he uh, originally corrupted a bunch of hyenas, uh, transforming them into uh, these creatures called gnolls who have an endless hunger, so they desire to eat everything. Yenogu's whole deal is he wants to eat everything. Uh, he's permanently hungry. So his gnolls are just like that. They're um, abyssally corrupted. Uh, they're in Avernus because they're basically like uh, Targnar is leading a pack of gnolls into uh, the first layer of hell on the commands of his uh, demon prince god. Um, Excellent. And uh, they're like, they're they they attack as a pack. They basically barrel into villages and just like gnolls hold deals. They barrel into villages. They consume everything. They eat every person and then go on and kill the next village. And that's kind of the whole deal. We're next on to Tiamat. 
Uh, Tiamat is uh, from uh, is is similar to like a lot of these other well, like the big characters you've seen uh, these god characters uh, multiple modules she actually has two whole modules um, where uh, um, the uh, the whole deal is uh, people trying to re bring her into the world effectively uh, fifth edition modules mm. um, like the like the whole point is is yeah they're trying to uh, resummon the dragon queen because uh, she is uh, she is trapped in a pit on the first layer of Vernus. Which is weird because uh, she is a chaotic evil character on the layer on the first layer of a lawful evil plane. So she doesn't belong mm. there. She's she's been uh, uh, trapped in a pit there effectively, and uh, yeah. she is constantly waiting to break free uh, and finally uh, return the world to her chromatic dragon offspring. She is the big dragon, and yet again, my brain just went, "Hold up, she's the same power level as the green dragon from earlier. That's not right." <laughs> what? <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so her like her using one of like each uh, you know mana land type sort of adds up because each dragon has been assigned to one of those ones for the chromatic thing. So like that all checks as like she is one of each of those because that's her deal. She has one head for each uh, chromatic dragon there is, uh, which can each breathe its own breath weapon attack. And um, honestly, they should. She needs a lot more going on. Honestly, her her abilities do not in any sort of form match the power level of the character that she is. Third from the last, we have. Trellasara, Moon Dancer. Trellasara is kind of a character where uh, the initial thing you'd get from it wouldn't be that fascinating. Uh, she's uh, a uh, side character from the Chosen Air series, which was a murder mystery set in Baldur's Gate. Um, and her whole deal in that series is basically that she is a um, a cool sword mage, which is called a blade singer in elf culture, mm. um, where they use magic to and dance to... Uh, enhance their combat ability uh, with a weapon uh she is also a drow um and what she best represents and you can see in the picture that's your drow around her those drow yeah. are the good drow they follow uh the god uh eliastri uh the who is the uh the good drow mage goddess and uh in the series uh, uh eliastri has just returned um because she was originally uh basically pushed away by Lolf, who, like, doesn't like the idea of good drow. She wants all drow to be under her, basically. Trellasara Trilla represents this very fascinating thing of um, of the good drow trying to uh, renegotiate themselves back into a world that fears and hates them, because they've always just been seen as, like, slavers and raiders up until this point. She is a priestess, but she's not a cleric. She's actually a blade singer. She's a she's a, a sword mage, basically. Um, ah. Is what I could find from the from the from the chosen air series on it at the very least. Um, she does have some healing though as well, which makes you think that maybe she's a cleric, uh, wizard multi class. I think. Mm. Um, but the obviously the D and D uh, law stuff doesn't really tell you about multi classing. It's just kind of like a thing you have to like headcanon yourself because it makes sense into the actual books um yeah and that's but i think that's kind of the vibe though and then our penultimate character uh, our last two characters are <laughs> i know a little bit about these characters that's how well known they are um volo guide to monsters uh volo obviously the big thing that most people might know him for would be volo's guide to monsters the D, &D mm -hmm. book which they which uh, i naturally is... had to purchase as a business expense for the creation of this video of course uh, you have to. Um, uh, he is. Uh, uh, his whole deal is that he likes to travel around um, uh, the plane, uh, around the world of Faerun, around Borders Gate, uh, visiting various dangerous locales and, and trying to find out about monsters and stuff. And like the whole book really emphasizes what Volo's character is, which is that most of the facts he says about monsters is either made up, kind of wrong, or um, is like him misinterpreting things. Because Volo is what I like to think of as an archetypal uh, straight white dude um, walking around the plain of Baldur's Gate uh, like piggybacking on adventurous parties and then just sort of like fancying up what's going on there and just sort of like assuming that nothing can go wrong for him because nothing has so far he's like he's kind of like a comedy like he is kind of a comedically useless and incompetent character not not to invoke the um the the trash writing of um of JK Rowling but kind of a Gilderoy Lockhart type yes very much <laughs> all right and finally Xanathar guild kingpin yeah so Xanathar is uh a representative if anything of beholders as a 
basically a race within D and D. He appears in like a bunch of different things, various modules, various supplements. He has his own like uh, PHB, uh, sorry PHB like additional book that he has that like adds a bunch of subclasses and a bunch of uh, background things um, that he like has little comments on and stuff that really adds to his like idea of like he's seeing himself as uh, the superior creature, which is what all, be all beholders think that they are the best thing in existence, but they're always paranoid about who they are, um, which makes him the ideal ruler for. The Thieves Guild that he runs, Xanathar's Guild of Thieves, um, which is why he's a kingpin. He runs that with his uh, the aid of his uh, uh, confidant, uh, the goldfish Silgar. Uh, the goldfish uh, dies because it's a goldfish. It dies every couple of years. Uh, and yeah. the Guild of Thieves that he runs is so terrified of the rage he goes into if he finds out his goldfish died, that they just keep replacing it with a different goldfish. But at this point, we're probably like hundreds of goldfish deep um, with how long beholders can live for. <laughs> uh, his abilities really i think represent the fact that like so can't cast spells uh, is the uh the central eye of a beholder is an anti-magic ray ah. which is while they're staring at you you cannot cast spells and the taking the top card of your library is the thieves he runs a thieves guild that steals magical items for him um and he plays top card of your things and spends mana because he has a huge range of magical items so he steals magical items and then has the power to use them during fights basically uh thank you um so much uh lily for jumping on the uh the channel to explain all of this your insights have been fantastic do you want to just do a quick like uh shout out to uh let folks who are watching know uh who you are and where they can find you and stuff like that so my name is uh, Lily Simpson. I have that name on every platform that I'm on now because I decided it's just easy that way. I am a, I want to say a YouTuber, but I think I'm more famous on Twitter now. So that's depressing. I, uh, my YouTube is predominantly based around trans content. However, I am currently looking at uh, going into doing D&D &D lore videos. So this is actually surprisingly um, uh, well-timed as an appearance can go, I think. And there we go. Thank you once again to Lily Simpson for jumping in and helping out with this video. Thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon uh, for helping to make this my full-time job. Those were all of the D&D &D references that exist in Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Hey, but there are loads of references in the Adventures in the Forgotten Realms Commander decks as well. Aren't you going to talk about those? Shut the fuck up, you fucking bastard. I'm not doing anymore. I'm done. I've done my time. I'm ah, a baby. I'm cut to credits. Off. I'm going to fucking kill you. A massive thank you to all of my patrons, and a special big sexy thank you to all of my $10 patrons, who include 1, 2, 3, 4, I Declare a Class War, A Fool of Five Colors, A Gay American Couple, A Gender Fluid Goblinoid Rip Roaring and Ready for Arson, God, I love you people. Uh, a waste of a perfectly good skeleton. Akumi the Reaper, Adam Gable, AJ Ingram, Alex Berman, Alex Flynn, Alice Perales, Alison Steele, an alt-right sleeper agent who gives monies to communist Booker Idaka, and then in parentheses probably Tibbles for Sona, an Umbreon pastry, Ourobraxis Siberia with the B capitalized and in square brackets, cleave again, uh, Basu Gasu Baku Hatsu Baku Matsu, Benjamin Easter, Biscuit Blade, Blake Evers, Bradley Rose, Brian Dunn, Kalululu, Kalululu, you've added an extra Lou on the end of your name, Kalulu. You got me good. Chase Beard, Charles Cohen, Charles McElrath, Chris DeVos, Serso Ceresa, Cloud Chaser Kestrel, Cognitive Glitch, Darth Pink Hippo, Deadpan Goff, D&D is bad actually and you should play some indie TTRPGs instead, this is a threat. Um, uh, going off script for a second, yeah, fucking go play some indie games, um, indie TTRPGs. Um, the first uh, RPG that I ever played, ever um, game mastered was uh, Apocalypse world uh and i think it's i think it's like free to access online i'm pretty sure i think like you can buy the physical copy but there's a free pdf download um i really highly recommend that it was a great great jaunt uh anyway duncan dystopico exidian elfonzi erica valentine ethan abraham everybody loves robots faxel felix mortem fiona perry fiona fofa Foxy Dean, Future Beagle, Grey Days, Hans Matthewsen? 
Hans Mathewson, I hope I'm getting that one right. Have you considered human rights maybe? Hawaiian juice box. Hypercube MTG. I am saying this only because our global economic system does not intrinsically support artistic expression. I want Emrakul to dominate me. In response, I bolt myself. In response, table flip. Jake Colburn, Jennifer Klein, Jessica Settle, Johnny Rifle, Joshua M. Stephan, Julius Holm, Just Mild Lilac, Carlia Whithart, Caitlin Evers, Kate B., Koo Zombie, Curd Ape Apologizer, Kyle Denley, Leliana, Lily of the North Star, Literally a Ghost That Pushes Over Candles, Linnea, Madame Monroe, Magic Arcanum, Mark Douglas, Matthew Marks, Matthew Short, Max Cooper, Mike Mavramatis, Mr. Skolaton, N. Ben, Okami, Omar Altibahi, Oops Orsini, Pappy Markov Was a Mistake, Peter Carter, Phoenix Swans, Romeo Joe, Singularity But the First Eyes Are One, Samuel Kona, Several Goblins in a Trench Coat, Sky Johnson, Stephen Christopher, Steve Pospiech is still hoping for a not broken four colour Omnath, Swan Hunter, Tali Isin, Tana Matone, uh, Taylor Street, Ted Cruz, the Fiddler Crab Goddess, the Ghost of Karl Marx in 4D, the Jelly Bean Warlock, the one and statistically only Wilder New Year, Thelon, Reaper of You, Tybalt and Oko Should Make Out, Totally a Spy, Travis K, Trent, uh, ah, Trey Ernst, Trey Parker, Untap Upkeep Lose, Vincer, Vladimir Gorvakov, Wesley, that monologuing communist, Why Does John Avon Always Lose, He Mostly Draws Lands, Yes I Stole That Joke, Shoot Me, Xenon, and Xanaron. And a massive thank you to all of my other patrons, and I'm terribly sorry to uh, Wesley and, uh, and the person who keeps changing, changing their name to a full, like, uh, joke. Uh, I, I've released this video a lot earlier than I normally do in the month, and so I don't think you've had the um, had the chance to change your thing. Uh, but please do, please do feel free to change it uh, uh, after this video is out. Um, anyway, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm gonna go sleep. I think. <laughs> Goblin time! Hey! Goblin time! Hey! Goblin time! Goblin time! Goblin time! Goblin time! Goblin time! Goblin time! Goblin! <laughs> you know, there was a point in my life that I wanted to be a lawyer.